Good morning. Thank you guys for the opportunity to present today. Um, my name is Anna Cantrell, recently changed from Ely. When I found out it was illegal to have one name in one place and another name in another, thank you to Dr. Farkas who instructed me on that. Um, so uh, today, what the heck am I going to talk to you guys about? Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about survival. Uh, and I think to introduce the topic, I'm going to share with you my uh, pathway to surgery. I had a little bit of an atypical uh, journey here. So when I was a kid, uh, I actually wanted to be a doctor. But somewhere along the way, I got a little bit off track, much to my parents' dismay. Uh, and as an angsty teen, I decided I was going to become a professional Shakespearean actress. So I auditioned for theater schools all around the country, and I ended up at UCLA's School of Theater, Film, and Television. Now, I had a blast studying theater. My uh, transcript is pretty exciting. Um, but I hated Los Angeles. So in my escape, in my attempt to escape the histrionic drama of the theater world and the LA smog and traffic, uh, I found UCLA's Outdoor Adventures program. And with this group, I spent every weekend and spare moment gallivanting off into the Eastern Sierras and Joshua Tree and other wild places and dragging along with me uh, groups of paying uh, unassuming UCLA college students who were just looking for an adventure. I worked my way up the ranks as a guide, and by my third year of college, I was ready to be a lead guide uh, on my first trip. So I was fresh off of a wilderness first responder course, which is a nine-day course that was a prerequisite for the job, and I was ready to go. This first trip was a canoeing adventure up the Black Canyon in Nevada. I'd been on the trip several times before as an assistant guide, so I knew it was pretty awesome, and that the highlight of this trip was canyoneering up these slot canyons, which occur a lot off the side of the river. And as you get to the tops of these canyons, you come in contact with these beautiful swimming pool sized crystal clear hot springs. It was pretty awesome. To get to these hot springs, however, required uh, climbing up ropes uh, up the faces of small waterfalls. I still don't quite understand how UCLA's risk management allowed this trip to happen, but it was really fun. Unfortunately, on this trip, my first trip as a lead guide, one of my participants slipped and fell at the top of one of these canyons and ended up with an open humerus fracture and an obvious femur fracture. I didn't know what to do. <laughs> now, somehow, some, some way, I managed to rig up a harness out of backpacks and backpack straps and tie together enough pieces of loose strapping to create an anchor so that we could lower our patient down these waterfalls and make it back to our canoes. Once we got back to the river, we got lucky, and with our whole team screaming, we managed to flag down a motorboat. Just note, this was the only motorboat we had seen in the four days leading up to this adventure. Um, they got us out to the base of the canyon, but there still wasn't cell phone service, so we drove him to the nearest hospital, where he underwent what felt like a 12-hour surgery. After this, um, I called his family during the operation, and I remember hanging up the phone and having a meltdown and vowing that I would never be so ill-prepared for such a situation again. So this first experience with wilderness medicine set me off on a, a long course to gain more skills and knowledge that has been ongoing for the past 17 years. After my time at UCLA, I worked for the National Outdoor Leadership School and then for the Wilderness Medicine Institute. I then got certified as an EMT and worked for Big Sky Ski Patrol, and finally took a wilderness paramedic course and began working for the ambulance in Bozeman, Montana. Uh, somewhere along this pathway, my interest in medicine and science surpassed my desire to be prepared for my next adventure, and I ended up in medical school. And finally, here at UC Davis. So this talk started out as a talk about wilderness medicine. But as I started flipping through my textbooks and notes from this prior medical school years, I realized that I had actually learned a lot more from my experiences than just how to tape an ankle or build a fire. And some of these other lessons might be more applicable to this group. Safety and staying out of trouble has been on my mind a lot lately as I prepare to leave UC Davis and go out on my own. Uh, and so I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about the anatomy of a disaster, how to prevent one, oops, sorry, how to prevent one, and what to do if you find yourself in one of these situations. 
So disclosures, uh, I'm not nearly as cool as I once was, and though I used to have lots of adventures in the backcountry, uh, this is a picture of my most recent trip to Tahoe. <laughs> <laughs> so let's start out by talking about some of the most important rules of survival. Number one, prevention. Number two, prevention. Number three, prevention. It is so much easier to prevent yourself from getting into a situation where you are fighting for survival than it is to actually survive. We know that once one member of an expedition is injured, the likelihood that another person will become injured increases immediately. As I used my group's strength to lower my patient down those waterfalls, I was acutely aware of how risky it was for the other participants. We got lucky. Now, prevention is important in the operating room as well, as complications beget more complications. <clears throat> so how do we prevent these accidents and disasters from happening? I think judgment is one of the most important aspects of prevention. Paul Petzold, who is the founder of the National Outdoor Leadership School, defined judgment as such, the ability to relate a total experience to a specific activity. Learning judgment and assessing priorities is as important as perfecting techniques. In fact, Teaching techniques without commensurate judgment can be dangerous. It's relatively easy to teach a skier how to go backcountry skiing. They can just spend $1,500 on a pretty cool setup and they're off and ready to go. But unfortunately, it takes years to develop skills with building a snow pit, interpreting the results, listening to the snow, following the weather patterns. And a confident skier without this judgment is an accident and a disaster waiting to happen. Likewise, it may be relatively easy to teach residents how to operate, at least some residents, um, but the knowledge of when to operate and when not to operate is perhaps more important in keeping us out of trouble. We aren't born <coughs> with judgment, and judgment in one setting doesn't automatically lead to judgment in another setting. So what is it exactly, and how do we go about obtaining it? If you look in the dictionary, the dictionary defines judgment as an informed opinion based on numerous past experiences. Well, this makes sense, except that we all know people who have tons of experience and no judgment. <laughs> so it turns, oops, it turns out, uh, sorry, I keep flipping through. It turns, I was trying to flash through Mr. Trump here, but um, it turns out experience alone does not automatically turn into judgment. One has to carefully and thoughtfully reflect on their experience, and it is best that this reflection is guided by uh, mentors who have lots of experience and good judgment themselves. Once we've reflected on our experience, we can then use that reflection to predict future experiences that might help us to manage similar situations. Eventually, we have a somewhat similar experience and we fine tune our judgment again. Now, judgment also requires us to stay open to and pay attention to uh, what is happening in the moment. Unfortunately, no judgment can work as a hard and fast set of rules to, to tell you how to manage a certain situation, as each situation is unique. So this is all still pretty confusing. So at the National Outdoor Leadership School, they try to supplement judgment and uh, make decision-making a little bit more simple by teaching a grid. So the first thing you have to do, oh, I clearly don't know how to use this clicker. The first thing you have to do when you're trying to decide if an activity is safe is think about what is the worst case scenario? And how dangerous is this worst case scenario? Is it a high risk situation or a low risk situation? So let's talk about a potential high risk situation. This is a picture of Alex Honnold, free solo climbing the face of Half Dome, which means he has no anchors, no ropes, and he's relying completely on his body and the rubber on his climbing shoes to ascend. So worst case scenario, he falls thousands of feet to his death. I know this sounds extreme, but as surgeons, we deal with this all the time, every day, as death is almost always a potential complication when we offer a surgery. Now, the next thing you have to think about is how likely is this outcome to happen? So in surgery, we have all kinds of calculators based on medical risk factors and the patient's injuries and the extent of their disease to help us predict survival it's still somewhat gray. Now, for Alex Hanold, the probability of him falling to his death on the face of Half Dome might be relatively low. He's a pretty skilled climber, uh, and this climb, while most of us may not be able to get off the ground, is actually relatively easy for him. So I'm sure he thinks about the risks versus the benefits uh, and the joy that he gets from climbing and ultimately decides that for him, the benefits outweigh the risks, uh, the relatively low but high consequence risk that he might fall. 
Now let's talk about me free solo climbing the face of Half Dome. This is clearly not Half Dome, that is me climbing. Um, I enjoy climbing, but I like my ropes and I like my anchors, uh, and I am anything but a gifted climber. So for me, uh, free solo climbing the face of Half Dome, uh, the, the, the probability of me falling to my death would be 100%. <laughs> I would never try it. All right, so let's talk about a lower risk situation, bouldering. Now there's actually probably more injuries with bouldering. Um, but the injuries tend to be more often sprained ankles, broken ankles, broken arms, ligamentous injuries, etc. So ultimately, I think it's a lower risk activity, even though there are more injuries. Bouldering problems are rated a little bit differently from climbing. Uh, the moves tend to be harder since climbers can often sustain these moves for the shorter period of time it takes to get to a small, the top of the smaller rock. Now, this is a picture of Harris bouldering in Yosemite. Now, he's a pretty good climber, so I think if he, when he goes bouldering, he pushes the limits a little bit, climbs some pretty hard stuff. Um, and if he continues to climb a lot, uh, I'd say there's a relatively high probability that at some point he's going to get injured, and I think he actually has had some bouldering injuries before. Um, so he gets really good disability insurance, and he thinks about the risks versus the benefits, and he decides to go boulder. Now, for me, uh, I wouldn't be able to get off the ground on this bouldering problem, so the probability that I get hurt unless I fall on the hike on the way there is relatively low, so I'd say go for it. So in surgery, we have our red zones. We have, you know, the elective hernia repair on the uh, large asymptomatic ventral hernia and the 90-year-old bedridden woman with pulmonary hypertension and a BMI of 60, something we would never do. And we have our green zones, but most of surgical decision-making is in those gray zones. And it's up to us to know those impossible to memorize percent likelihoods that things happen uh, and factor in patient wishes, excuse me, patient wishes, quality of life, et cetera, so that we can weigh the risks versus the benefits of our potential uh, intervention and make a decision. All right, don't worry, my whole talk won't be quite so vague. Um, let's talk a little bit more about some of the more tangible uh, ways that we are able to present, prevent disaster. So on the top here is a picture of an avalanche ski setup. We have a shovel, a beacon, and a probe. So the beacon, which is the yellow device there, is worn by the skier who goes backcountry skiing. Now in the event that they are caught in an avalanche, uh, their beacon transmits a signal which can be picked up by other beacons which their ski partners are wearing. They then have to kind of ski down the mountain trying to pick up this signal. And once they think they're over the area of maximum signal, they use their probe, which extends to like a long skinny stick, stick it down into the snow and try to locate the exact location of the body. And then they use their shovel to dig up the patient. Um, it's a great setup and it's life-saving, but it does not uh, take the place of avalanche judgment. Uh, and it, and it's really important that teammates actually know how to use these beacons because every year people die wearing their beacons with partners that do not know how to find them. Next thing I'm gonna show you is some climbing gear. So on the top there, on top left, is a camming device. Now this is a spring-loaded device. You pull on a lever and the arms um, retract in and then you can wedge it into a crack in the rock. Uh, and then when the rope pulls on it, the arms actually push out against the rock so it creates an anchor. The one below it is called a nut. It just has to be wedged into uh, uh, the appropriate shaped rock and it can work as an anchor. These are great devices. They also save lives, but inappropriately placed or being used on a climb that is uh, above the climber's level of expertise. They create a false sense of security and can actually, uh, I'd say, increase the risk. We have uh, equipment in the operating room as well. Extensive equipment, and most of it's designed to help keep us out of trouble, but it's up to us to understand the equipment and its limitations. I know we've presented M&Ms before where we failed to understand our equipment or it didn't work the way it was supposed to. This one's pretty simple. A strong knot will save your life in the outdoors and a patient's life in the operating room. All right, plan ahead and study your map. Let's take a look at a topographical map. This is a USGS 7.5 minute topographical map of Half Dome. Now it takes a little bit of work and practice to get used to reading these topographic maps, but once you're comfortable, I think they're pretty cool. Um, so to help explain how they work, let's look at a topographical map of the hand. If you look at the profile view, you can see that the spacing between the lines is the same. Each distance represents the same vertical elevation gain. Now, if you look at the hand from the bird's eye view, you see that the steeper areas of the hand, the lines are closer together, 
while on the more less steep areas of the hand, uh, the lines appear further apart. Now I have a second picture here. This is a, a picture of a topographical map in the middle of a mountain and then how it would look depending on which side of the mountain you're standing. You can see um, that the ridges, let me use the pointer here, uh, the ridges here um, are actually marked by curvature of the line that points down towards the area of lower elevation where the valleys, perhaps easier to see on the hand, actually point upwards towards the area of higher elevation. All right, so let's look back at our topographical map of Half Dome. So you can see the shaded area, uh, you can see the shaded area here where it just looks, the lines are so close together, together that it just appears to be shaded brown. And then we have the famous hiking trail up the ridge of Half Dome here and another ridge here, which is actually a, a lower rated climb called Snake Dyke. Uh, and then eventually if we stare at it enough, it starts to look like the actual real life picture of Half Dome. Now when I used to guide uh, expeditions for the National Outdoor Leadership School, we almost traveled almost exclusively off trail. So I would spend days, sometimes weeks, studying the maps, looking at every valley, pass, um, mountain range, until I could practically see what it looked like in real life. And without that, and without following along the maps as we hiked, uh, people got lost, and this was a, a, a huge risk. So we have our maps in the operating room as well. Uh, and it is up to us to spend our time studying these maps, these anatomy books, these CT scans, so that we know our way once we get into the operating room. All right, let's change gears. Uh, and imagine that all of our efforts to stay out of trouble fail. This is a phrase that is taught over and over again in wilderness medicine. This is a phrase that was in my head as I navigated my first uh, adventure with wilderness emergency. It comes to my head as I'm going to the bedside of a crashing patient or heading to the trauma bay for a real 911. How people react in the midst of crisis or emergency varies from one person to another. And studies have actually been done uh, looking at the general population, which have shown three broad categories of how people behave when confronted with a life-threatening emergency. 10 to 15% of people can remain relatively calm. This subset's able to collect their thoughts quickly, their awareness of a situation remains intact, and their reasoning abilities are not significantly impaired. They're able to assess the situation, make a plan, and act. The majority of people are stunned and bewildered. Their reasoning is impaired, their thinking is difficult, these people behave reflexively and almost automatically, and most importantly, their field of attention is significantly narrowed. And I think this is one of the contributors to the phenomenon of one accident or one complication leading to more. The final group uh, tends to show a high degree of inappropriate and ineffective behavior. This subset is characterized by uncontrolled weeping, confusion, fear, and screaming. Um, now, as surgeons, we have to be in this top group. I don't think most of us fall into this bottom group, at least not that I've seen in the operating room. Um, but we want to be in the top group. So how do we place ourselves here? How do we avoid having fear govern our actions? Our brains process fear in a couple of ways. There's an instantaneous alert that goes to the amygdala. And this alert is immediately communicated to the brain and the rest of the body, you know, which sets off this reaction of fear, alarm, and stress. After this initial response, maybe seconds later, the conscious mind gets the signal. And it's up to the conscious brain to process this, think about it rationally, and then send the message back to the body and the amygdala. Now, if fear is necessary, it will keep the body on alert and keep the fear reaction going. But if fear is not necessary, it can calm down the brain and the body. The cortex is slower, reasonable, reasonable and deliberate, while the amygdala is quick and emotional. Now, Plato called this emotional response the horse of emotion, and reason is the jockey. You need both in an emergency, but the goal is to get the jockey in control of the horse as quickly as possible. It's not the lack of fear that separates elite performers from the rest of us. They're afraid too, but they're not overwhelmed by it. So in wilderness medicine, uh, we talk about a few simple steps if you do find yourself in a situation of disaster. Sit down for at least 30 minutes. Give yourself a chance for the adrenaline rush to pass through. Allow your higher brain to catch up. Have a sip of water, take a deep breath, have a snack. Then accept the situation. If you're lost, acknowledge it. If you're injured, acknowledge it. 
get, examine your injuries, be realistic, and do not deny the circumstances. Number three, protect and maintain life. Administer first aid, maintain your body temperature, protect your resources. Four, make a plan. Think, your brain is your best survival tool, especially in surgeons, uh, use it. And then finally, adapt. Observe what's going on around you, look out for hazards, be creative with your resources, uh, and adapt as things change. Of course, not all emergency situations allow for a pause. And in the OR, we certainly can't sit down for 30 minutes, um, but, we, but we can pause. And some of, some of these situations require uh, reflexive action. Examples of this are getting into lightning position in the middle of a strike, swimming to the top of an avalanche and protecting the air pocket around your mouth, diving under the table in an earthquake, putting a finger on a major bleeder in the operating room, um, and protecting ABCs in the trauma bay. For these situations, and in order to survive these, we have to practice so that these actions become reflexive and automatic. But after this, I think these same rules apply in the operating room. Just to end this section, I'm going to share a quote from Dr. Sullenberger, or Sully. We have to have situational awareness. We have to be able to create a mental model of our reality. We have to be good risk managers, be mindful. We have to understand our process so that we can sensitize ourselves to risks. Bad outcomes are rarely the result of a single failure, but are instead the result of a chain of events. And when we sensitize ourselves to risk, we are able to identify it proactively, and we can break the chain and have a good outcome. All right, so let's change gears again and, and talk about another important aspect of dealing with an emergency. In the world of outdoor guiding, leadership is a hot topic. It's crystal clear that in order to safely guide a group of novices through a remote setting requires a strong leader. As such, leadership is taught. Knowles instructors have to go through a three-month leadership training, which is thought to be necessary to complement their technical skills in climbing, mountaineering, and backcountry travel. Leadership education is a huge component of the curriculum taught on every course. Now, in surgery, not everyone goes into medicine or surgery looking to be a leader. Uh, but we know that leadership in the operating room can affect patient outcomes, and several conceptual models of leadership have been shown um, to improve the situation. Still, we receive little to no training when it comes to leadership, and leadership in surgery remains a nebulous and ill-defined ill concept. So let's look at some of the suggestions for leadership in surgery in some of these papers. Leadership is a process of social influence in which one person can enlist the aid and support of others in the accomplishment of a common task. For surgeons to be considered effective leaders, they need to engage in professional behaviors and have the ability to communicate effectively in an interprofessional context. Blah, blah, blah. So clearly, we all know exactly how to be surgeons or be leaders based on these definitions. <laughs> Being a strong leader is always harder than we think it will be, and I think it helps to understand our natural leadership tendencies. So I'm hoping you guys will humor me for a minute while I take you through an exercise I used to do with the participants on my Knowles courses. All right, I'm going to draw an imaginary line in the imaginary dirt. Now, picture yourself standing in the middle of this line. Move your imaginary self to the left if you are more like the water. You don't often voice strong opinions, even if you have them. You put others before yourself pretty consistently. You're flexible. Others may not know where you stand unless they ask you directly. Now move your imaginary self to the right if you are more like the wind. You state your opinion and take a stand easily. People know exactly what you think and what you want. You are an open book. Okay, this is the x-axis. Now from your position on the x-axis, move down if you are cool and calm like the ice. Nothing phases you, you have nerves of steel, it's difficult to get you riled up. Move towards the top if you are hot like fire. It doesn't take a lot to get you riled up. You consider yourself openly passionate about a lot of things. All right, now remember which quadrant you're in. We're gonna talk a little bit about each one. These are represent the leadership styles that you naturally gravitate towards. Um, and all of these quadrants have their strengths and, strengths and weakness. So do me a favor and raise your hand if you're in the right lower quadrant. Just curious. Nobody's going to raise their hand. <laughs> Nobody's in the right lower quadrant. <clears throat> I think most people are in the right lower quadrant in surgery. <laughs> All right. So these are the drivers. What does it mean to be a driver? Drivers are information and opinion givers. 
Decision making is easy for them. They take a stand, they direct, they make things happen. Indecision drives them crazy. Drivers have to be careful to not overlead or step on toes. They have to work to maintain their connection with the group or they can come across as too impersonal. When working with drivers, the rest of us need to be direct, be direct as possible. So I placed Dr. Galante in this category. <laughs> I, luckily, I don't think he's here today. Uh, but he's a skilled driver. When Dr. Galante walks into the trauma bay or the operating room, there's no question of who is on, in charge. Uh, and after rounds with Dr. Galante, everyone knows the plan. When you ask him a question, or when he asks you a question, you may think he's asking for your opinion, but don't be fooled, there's a right answer. <laughs> All right, so raise your hand if you're in the left lower quadrant. I'm not gonna wait. Oh, there we go, we got some of these guys. All right, these are the architect analysts. Now, luckily, Dr. Bull just left, but I'll tell a story about him. <laughs> so I'm currently on the surgical oncology service with Dr. Bull, and the first case we did together this month was a mastectomy. Uh, and I think Journey or Eagles or something like that was playing in the background, but there wasn't a lot of talking. Uh, Dr. Bold uh, was retracting while I worked on my side of the mastectomy, and I was retracting with one hand, and I was boving with the other, and I came across a huge perforating vessel. And you know, both my hands were being used, so I couldn't pick up the vessel, and Dr. Bold wasn't offering to pick up the vessel, so I proceeded to bovey all around the vessel until finally I really had no choice, and I bovied through the vessel, and it bled. And Dr. Bull just looks at me and says, hmm, I was waiting to see how that was going to play out. <laughs> so who are these architect analysts? These are the information seekers, the listeners, and the observers. I saw some people raise their hands. So these types of people can come, oops, sorry, this is weird, preview. <laughs> um, these types of people uh, can come up with totally off-the-wall solutions that work. Um, oh, sorry, hold on. Totally off the wall solutions that work. Um, they sometimes, however, have a hard time making a quick decision or they may defer all, lots of decisions to their team and focus on a single strong decision. So when working with these guys, it's important to ask them and be specific, you know, when are you gonna make the decision and how are you gonna delegate the decision? Uh, and also to honor their need for information and time. All right. So, left upper quadrant, who was up here? Dr. Lechko is going to raise his hand because he saw his picture. So I put, uh, the relationship masters are excellent in the team setting. They build and sustain community, they seek feedback, build rapport, uh, consensus and commitment within their team. They consider each of the team members' wishes, action and viewpoints and actions when they're considering making a decision. They get to know their group well and they draw on individual unique strengths and weaknesses. Like all quadrants, relationship masters have their pitfalls. They can have a hard time taking a stance if it puts a relationship at risk. They often downplay their own needs to their detriment. You can't have enough or you can't have too much respect or caring as part of your group. But this leadership <laughs> style is most effective when combined with uh, functions from the other quadrants. So I place Dr. Leshikar in this group because I think he leads alongside his residents rather than out in front. He gets to know the team members, their strengths, their weaknesses. He utilizes them, and he goes to great lengths to protect his team in any way possible, even if this means running trauma 922s while his trauma chief is taking care of her own sick child. And finally, raise your hand if you are in the right upper quadrant. Okay, these are the spontaneous motivators. So I'm going to keep this quote anonymous, but this is my favorite quote about Dr. Farmer. Dr. Farmer wakes up in the morning and says, today I shall fly. And we all say, yes, what a great idea, we'll fly with you. Um, so spontaneous motivators are the energizers. They are the light bulbs in the group. They voice their opinions and ideas and supply sufficient passion and fuel to follow these ideas. They are excellent at motivating people and they process a sense of mission and vision. They excel at having energetic dialogues with other team members. Like all leadership quadrants, people in this quadrant have some struggles. They can struggle with objectivity and being overly emotionally bound to their ideas. But the roles of spontaneous motivators are essential. And this is a very hard skill to teach or practice. Groups need this function to sparkle, create, prod, stir the pot, and impassion. Interestingly, many charismatic leaders and cult leaders come from this quadrant as well. <laughs> so it's important to know... 
<laughs> Dr. Pevick was there too. I saw him raise his hand. So maybe it's maybe it makes sense that they're the leaders here this morning. So uh, it takes. It's important to note that leadership style should be fluid, and all of and different leadership or different um, situations in medicine uh, lend themselves to different leadership styles. Leadership with trainees and on rounds is different from leadership in the OR when things aren't going well versus leadership in the lab. And all of the examples that I gave today, I think, are really strong leaders because they're able to traverse these quadrants. Dr. Galante is a natural driver, but he is able to slip into that relationship master role when he's dealing with residents sobbing in his office and having personal meltdowns. Dr. Farmer is a spontaneous motivator, I think, but she can sit back and be the architect analyst when she's listening to her uh, perspectives from her sometimes whiny chief residents. Um, Anyway, I think it's important to be at least aware of these different leadership styles and where we naturally put ourselves so that we can traverse um, the quadrants and, and help get the outcomes we want. All right, let's move on. So even the best leaders uh, depend on their team. Team is one of the most important ingredients to success in a situation. So as I was looking through all of my wilderness teaching materials, I came across something I used to read to my expedition groups early on in our trips. And I think you guys will see some of the lessons to be learned are applicable to surgeons as well. It may be most applicable to the residents, but I think everyone can appreciate this. So I'm just going to read this part. Expedition Behavior, The Finer Points by Howard Toon. A good expedition team is like a powerful, well-oiled, finely tuned machine. Members cook meals together, carry burdens together, face challenges together, and finally go to bed together. A bad expedition, on the other hand, is an awkward, ugly, embarrassing thing characterized by bickering, filth, frustration, and crispy macaroni. Nearly all bad expeditions have one thing in common, poor expedition behavior. Unfortunately, too many rules of expedition behavior remain unspoken. Rule number one, get the hell out of bed. Suppose your tent mates get up to fetch water and fire up the stove. Will you lie comatose in your sleeping bag? As they run an extensive equipment check, coil ropes, and fix your breakfast, they hear you start to snore. Last night you were their buddy. Now they are drawing up a list of things about you that make them want to spit. They will devise cruel punishments for you. You have earned them. The team concept is now defunct. Had you gotten out of bed, nobody would have had to suffer. Rule number two. Do not be cheerful before breakfast. <laughs> Some people wake up perky and happy as fluffy bunny rabbits. They put stress on those of us who are wake up as mean as rabid wolverines. Exhortations such as rise and shine sugar and greet the dawn pumpkin have been known to provoke pungent explicatives from rabid wolverine types. These curses in turn may offend fluffy bunny types. Indeed, they are issued with the sincerest intent to offend. Thus, the day begins with flying fur and hurt feelings. The best morning behavior is simple. Be quiet. <laughs> Rule number three, do not complain about anything, ever. It's 10 below zero, visibility is four inches, wind-driven hailstones are embedding themselves into your face like shotgun pellets. Must you mention it? Do you think your friends haven't noticed the weather? <laughs> Make a suggestion. Tell a joke, lead a prayer. Do not lodge a complaint. Your pack weighs 87 pounds. Your backpack straps are cutting into your flesh. Were you promised a personal Sherpa? Did somebody cheat you out of a mule team? If you can't carry your weight, get a motorhome. <laughs> Rule number four. Always carry more than your fair share. When the trip is over, would you rather be remembered as a rock or a sissy? Keep in mind that a pound or two of extra weight in your pack won't make your back hurt any more than it already does. In any given group of flatlanders, somebody is bound to bicker about the weight. When the argument begins, just take the extra weight yourself, then shake your head and gaze with pity on the slothful one. This is the more mature response to childish behavior. On the trail later that day, during the break, load the tenderfoot's pack with 20, ground, 20 pounds of extra gravel. Rule number five. Do not get killed. Suppose you summit K2 solo while chain smoking and carrying the complete works of Hemingway in hardcover. Pretty macho, huh? Suppose now that you take a vertical detour down a crevasse and never make it back to camp. Would you still qualify as a hero? And would it matter? Nobody's going to run any fingers through your chest hair. The worst thing to have on your outdoor resume is a list of possible locations of your body. So. 
All expedition really, all expedition behavior really flows from one principle. Think of your team, the beautiful machine first. You are merely a cog in that machine and that machine has a common goal. If you have something to prove, forget about joining the expedition. Your team will never have more than one member. Surgery and healthcare is really a team sport. None of us could do our jobs alone. Though we lose sight of it every now and then, we all share common goals and common experiences. As they pertain, paint, pertain to surgery, I would sum up these expedition rules as be respectful, work hard, take care of your patients, take care of yourselves, and take care of each other. Thank you. So I won't pinpoint anyone, but thank you to everyone in the department for teaching me over the past six years. Um, and a special thank you to my co-residents. Uh, as residency is long and hard, and we make, make it through because we have each other. And an extra, oops, an extra special thank you to my family, my husband, who snuck in despite my telling him not to. Uh, and our now one and a half year old, residency is so long that you can come here single, fall in love, get married, get pregnant, and have a one and a half year old when you graduate. So, <laughs> the end. Well, thank you. That was great. I have to confess, it was a little bit the National Outdoor Leadership School that attracted me to you in the very beginning when you applied, because I thought, if nothing else, this girl is tough. <laughs> and I think you uh, demonstrated that in so many ways through a long uh, journey, not only in surgery, but in life. Um, so there were a lot of great lessons there. I think more people will be willing to fess up to what um, quadrant they're in now. But any particular questions for Anna? OK. That was so cool. I had no idea you were such a cool person. <laughs> um, and my only all in the past. is that you've never taken us on an expedition. Yeah. <laughs> Find a couple days when we're all off. <laughs> Perhaps you could say she's taken you on many expeditions. <laughs> uh, no, I love the part about leadership and that the, the quotes there were so applicable to surgery. Uh, but what's yeah. your like craziest expedition? <laughs> scariest thing you've done? Oh, God. The scariest thing I've ever, actually the scariest things I've ever done have been stupid things that I went out ill-prepared for. My One of my best friends and I went on a nice little short trail run in Montana. Um, it was short, it was 18 miles, but it felt short at the time. And we went with our running shorts and our little hand water bottles and it started snowing halfway through and we were like trudge, like really, really snowing. Uh, and I couldn't feel my fingers for about a week and a half after that, or my feet. And uh, so it's the, just a sense of like, be prepared, you know, for anything always. So that was a one time mistake. That was probably the scaredest I ever was um, that something really bad would happen. Because we couldn't see the trail, and, you know, it was a disaster. <laughs> so even the smallest things can turn into yeah. that was like an afternoon jog, anyway. Yeah, <laughs> Dr. Salcedo. Okay. Yeah. I thought that was just, I, you, Pat, you could have been talking about residency and surgery. Um, is, is to take Monica's lead and ask you your story. So I wonder if you could, not to put you on the spot, but to put you on the spot. Um, <laughs> could you tell us maybe a story from your residency where you thought that some of these ideas of good expedition behavior or teamness carried the day? Yeah. For the, the youngsters in the room. Uh, sure. Um, well, for this morning, actually, I'll give an example. I made my poor team. I think Maggie was in the OR till like 11 o'clock last night, and uh, I needed to come here and get my presentation loaded up. And so uh, we, I made them round at 5:30 in the morning, um, which could have been terrible. We had like four consults yesterday, and um, just kind of a you know, I was stuck in clinic and Maggie was stuck in the OR and like the service was a mess and Kayla and I were rounding at, I don't know, 9 p.m. or something last night and um, it came in this morning and my interns, Kayla and Ashley, were chipper and cheerful and like, good morning and we talked about the patients and we walked around and round and nobody complained uh, and 
And they got out of bed. They got out of bed. They were on time. You know, it was... Uh, <laughs> uh, so the Wolverine fluffy bunny, I have enlisted that rule at home. I think I posted it up on the I am a Wolverine in the morning. But it's more before coffee than before breakfast. And my husband's a fluffy bunny, and we had uh, lots of flying fur and hurt feelings. Uh, lot, we're both residents, as many of you know. So we wake up, you know, oftentimes both find each other at the coffee maker at like 4:30 in the morning, and. He is like super chipper, and I just want to punch him in the face. So <laughs> I, uh, I have read this to him several times, and I think it may be partially responsible for why we're still married. So. <laughs> yeah, sure. Really great. Thank you so much. Kind of a weird topic. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.